Hello and welcome from the Pastor's Study. We are here today and we are carrying on in our series on repentance. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, your Bible and, and a pen and a paper, something to write with, something to write on, let me just open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this time. Thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word, to hear from you. And so, word of God, speak, let it fall down like rain. Father, give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we are in this series on repentance, and we're in Luke chapter 3, and today our text is verse 7. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never had to debate with a lost person whether or not they were sinners. I mean, they know that they're sinners. They may not receive Jesus Christ at that point in time, but the people that I've shared with knew absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were sinners. Now, they may not agree with everything that I call sin as being sin, but they know that there are some things in their lives that they, you know, need to get right because they aren't right. But then the other interesting thing is this. I have never had to debate with a lost person about repentance. I mean, they know that they need to repent. They know that they need to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Now, they may not know who to say it to, but I've never really had a lost person argue with me about repentance. Seems the only people that want to argue about repentance are people in the church. The only people who debate the issue of repentance are people in the church. Lost people don't seem to debate it. I think that deep down in every human soul, it is aware of sin and it's aware of that need to repent. But the only people that want to debate it are religious leaders. It was a religious uh, a group of leaders or a group of religious leaders that came to hear John the Baptist preach. And I want to take you to this passage in Luke chapter 3 and verse 7. But before we get there, just put your finger there and turn back to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. Because in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, When he saw, the, uh, speaking of John the Baptist, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the leaders, religious leaders, coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He is speaking to religious leaders and they're coming to be baptized. Then They're not just coming to hear him preach, but they're coming for baptism. And he has these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these religious leaders of the day, these preachers of the day, if you will, as well as the people from the area that he's in, Jerusalem and Judea. And they're coming in droves, in crowds, to hear John the Baptist. And he's preaching this message of repentance. He preaches a sermon on a repentance. And it begins in verse 7 of chapter 3 of Luke. And um, it says that he is preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus says there's nobody in, in the world that is greater than John the Baptist. And so I'm assuming that that would include his preaching prowess. Jesus is saying that. So we're going to look at that this morning and we're going to look at it from the perspective that Jesus says he was the greatest. We'll pick it up in verse 7 of chapter 3. And his sermon is going to be about repentance because John preached repentance. And he wasn't the only one to preach repentance. All of the Old Testament prophets preached repentance. The Lord Jesus himself preached repentance. But we don't seem to hear much about it in the church today. 
You know, not very many people are going to preach repentance because they just don't want to deal with it. Seems like in the church, we want to argue about it instead of, of, of doing it. And there are those that say that you, you aren't supposed to repent and believe that all we have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. That's all we need to do. We don't need to repent. But listen, if you believe that, there's a pile of scripture that you're going to have to overcome to say that. But there are those on the other side of the coin that believe that once you have repented, once you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you never have to repent again. So I'm just going to make everybody mad at me this morning and say that you're both wrong. I think that scripture makes it clear that we are to repent and and at the same time believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so as we look at this this morning, understand repentance is not an act of works. You see, when you repent, what you're doing is you're crying out to God and you're saying, I can't do anything. I need someone to forgive me. I need someone to save me. And I come to a holy God. I turn from my, from my sin. I repent of my sin. And there are a lot of us who've been in the church for a long, long time that need to repent. Not just on a personal level, but corporately as a church, we need uh, to repent. There's a need for a collective repentance, but that's for another time. John is going to preach this message on repentance here but let me tell you something John preached it Jesus preached it the prophets preached it the apostles preached it and if you're going to preach the gospel you better deal with it but now listen carefully folks because the repentance that God requires isn't all always the kind of repentance that we want to make the repentance that God requires isn't the kind of repentance that we want to make. You see, we are willing to repent at a certain level. You know, and I I really have two points today, but I'm only going to get to one. But here it is. We want a repentance that will deliver us from the wrath, but not a repentance that changes our lives. Let me say that again. We want a repentance to deliver us from wrath, but not repentance that changes our nature. And that's exactly what John says to all of these who have come to hear him preach. They're come looking for a deliverance from the wrath, not a repentance that's going to change them and who they are, they change their nature. And, And that's what we are like in the church today. And let me tell you something, before we even get to Luke chapter 3 and verse 7, there was a very clear understanding by these Jews about what was going to happen when the Messiah came. In fact, there was a group that believed that John might have been the Messiah over in chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, now as the people were in expectation, they were looking, they were expecting, they all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. And so as we look at that, we think, you know, it's been 400 years since a word of God has come, 400 years since there's been a move of God. And John is out here in the wilderness and, and he's preaching like no one has preached for 400 years. And here's this group of people in expectation. They want the Messiah to come. And some of them were certain that it was John who was the Messiah. They knew that the Messiah was either on the scene or he was about to come on the onto the scene. And these Jews knew one thing about it. They knew that when the Messiah came, there would be judgment. There would be judgment. And, and, and because of that judgment, there's going to be wrath. And they understood that. Jesus points that out over in Luke chapter 7, verses 24, 27, talking about what Malachi said in chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. And and let me share that with you. 
Malachi chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For I love this. For he is like a refiner's fire, like launderer's soap. He will sit like a refiner in a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as, as gold and silver. Let me just take a rabbit trail here and explain something to you. A refiner of silver would take the silver, he would put it in a long-handled ladle, a ladle that was like a big spoon with a, a long handle, maybe three feet, and that refiner would hold that over the fire, and he would sit, feeling the heat of that fire himself, and he would sit, and he was waiting for that silver to be refined, and he knew when it was refined, he could see his reflection in it. And this is telling us that the Lord Jesus walks through that refining fire with us and he's right there with us in the midst of it and he's waiting for us for that refiner's fire to refine us to the point where he can see his reflection in us. And that is powerful stuff, folks. These people knew the Messiah was coming and there's going to be wrath and judgment to come. They're going to be refined. In verse 5 it says, Malachi chapter 3 verse 5 and I will come in near you for judgment I will be a swift witness against sorcerers against adulterers against perjurers against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans against those who turn away the alien because they do not fear me says the Lord of hosts he wants us refined he wants us to repent Look what it says over in verse 1 of chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be like stubble, and the day is coming when they shall be burnt up. Now, the Lord Jesus says the same thing. Um, and, and in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12, it's saying the same thing. Let me let me share that with you. And this is good. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will give he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat to his barn, but he will burn up the chaff in unquenchable fire. The Lord is coming and he is about to come again, folks. I believe he, we are so much on the threshold of his coming, but there's wrath coming. There's judgment coming as well. And let me tell you something. That isn't a symbol of peace. John is preaching and he's saying the Messiah is coming and when he gets here, there's going to be a lot of heat in the kitchen. And so you better make sure that you're wheat and not chaff. And so when all of these Jews, <coughs> pardon me, hear <coughs> John's preaching, they know the Messiah is coming and he's coming in judgment and wrath. But now just keep that in your mind and look for a moment at Luke chapter 3 and verse 7. And, and, and as he's beginning to preach, he's saying to these multitudes who, by the way, are going out to be baptized with or by him, he's saying, you brood of vipers. Now, folks, I've never been to preaching school. I don't know that, that, that they would teach you to call your congregation a brood of snakes, a bunch of snakes. My understanding is they don't do that. You know, they don't tell you to stand up in the pulpit and call the people a bunch of snakes. But understand, my commentary tells me that this is the present tense of the verb. And when, when you say, well, you know, I mean, what does that mean, present tense? It means that he says it over and over and over. Old John only has one string in his violin and he plucks it over and over and over again. You brood of vipers, you brood of vipers, you brood of vipers. He keeps 
calling them snakes. I mean, how would you like it if every time you came to church, the preacher stood up in the pulpit and said, you bunch of snakes. I mean, that's not really seeker friendly, is it? That's not what I would call a seeker friendly service. You're not going to grow a church like that. But that's what John does. And as you look at that Judean hillside and, and think about that coming down to the river it wouldn't come straight down in one straight line it would be weaving its way back down that hill like this back and forth and back and forth and um and john is watching all of these people wander their way down that hillside back and forth and it looks like a big snake is making its way down and he says you big snake come on down here but what's he doing He's saying, you are all sons of the devil. And if you think that's rough, you can look over at John chapter 8 and see Jesus does the exact same thing in verse 44 of John chapter 8. You see, from Revelation chapter 3 all the way to Revel, I'm sorry, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation chapter 12, he is known as the serpent, the devil. And in Matthew 23, 33, Jesus calls him the same thing again. Now, I can tell that you are all encouraged by this point. So let me get back to the text. He says, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Now, in that part of the world, as in our part of the world, when there's a huge fire, whether it's in California or out in BC, when there's a forest fire, the animals flee. They run from the fire. Now just think about what John is saying here. Who told you to escape from the wrath that is to come? You're like snakes that are trying to outrun the fire. And where do they go? They go to the water. He's saying you're not coming here for the baptism of repentance. You're not coming so that God is going to change your nature. You're coming down here to escape the wrath. Now, John is saying what you want is just fire insurance. You don't want to come and have a life that's changed. You're just coming for the fire insurance. You see, they thought this ritual of baptism would save them. And it's not unlike a lot of folks in the church today who figure that because their name is on a membership roll that they're a shoe in for heaven. I want to tell you, Flat out, if you are a member, you need to be committed to what you're a member of. You see, nobody preaches like that. Do you know why? Because they cut John's head off. Jesus preached like that and they put him on a cross. They stoned all the prophets, some of the apostles. You see, the people in the church aren't going to tolerate somebody preaching like that to them. You know, they'll, they'll go to a seeker-friendly service where they can sing Kumbaya. They, they'll go to where the worship is more uplifting, where the preacher is nice to them. Listen to me, folks. I am not preaching like that. I am not preaching like that at all. I'm just telling you what verse 7 says. You know, I wish I could get to verse 8, but i got to get through verse 7 first. But because it isn't preached in the church in our day and time, it's only argued and, and debated. People have no concept of what it is to repent. It's not preached, it's not taught, and it's not caught. And so what we have come to understand is that we've replaced repentance with five things in the church in our day and time. We've replaced repentance, first of all, with remorse with remorse over in, in second corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9 it says this now i rejoice not that you were made sorry but that your sorrow led to repentance for you were made sorrow in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing so paul is saying here is is that i don't re rejoice and I agree I don't rejoice when I preach hard sermons I don't rejoice you know and, and I don't want to bring you to tears but Paul says it happens so that you come to repentance 
there's a difference between shedding crocodile tears, folks, shedding those big tears and repentance. There's a big difference in that. We don't do repentance, though in our day and time we do remorse. Remorse, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry you found out. I'm sorry everybody knows. I'm sorry about all kinds of things, but there's no repentance. Repentance has been replaced by remorse. The second thing is, is that we've replaced repentance with penance. In the Latin Vulgate, there's a translation of repentance as penance. You see, by the 15th century, the Roman church had decided that you could do penance. You could come to a priest and he would assess your sin and, and hand out the penalty. And you could go to the priest and kiss his ring and kiss kiss his cross and, and, and you, you know, it would be penance. You know, listen, all we have to do is crowd to Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We don't have to go through kissing these icons. We don't have to go through lighting candles or kissing the ring of the priest. We can be saved by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And we repent of our sin. We turn from our sin. And if you are listening to me today and you have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, let me tell you something. Whoever calls on him, he never turns away. He never turns away. I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you are. If you call on him, he will forgive you and accept you right where you are. Somehow the church, the church in our day and time has decided that we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. Somehow we've decided that we can substitute repentance with all different kinds of things. And so we substitute repentance um, and, and, and just with penance, you know, I, and if I just come and, and, and show up at church instead of repenting, if I come and give money instead of repenting, you see, penance is no substitute for repentance. And we can't find penance anywhere in the word of God, by the way, it's nowhere to be found. So we've uh, substituted repentance with penance. We've substituted it with remorse. But the third thing is we've substituted and replaced penance with self-improvement. You know, if, if it feels good, if I can feel good. And so I get into all these books, these self-help books that, that you know, that, that'll make me feel good. You know, that if I do that, I, I'll be made better. And we go from one thing to another, hoping that it's going to make us feel better. But listen to me, getting a new puppy isn't going to make your marriage any better. You know, redoing the bathroom isn't going to make things better. Self-improvement is no replacement for repentance. And then the fourth thing is self-defensive attitude. <coughs> Do you know who was a master at, at that? It was King Saul. I mean, he, he'd repent a little bit, but then he decided that he would get defensive. And in our day and time, there are people who will repent just a little bit, but they do it with a self-defensive attitude. And then finally, there are those with selective repentance. Well, I'm going to repent of this, but I'm going to hang on to this over here. I don't want to repent that much. You know, I want to make it to heaven, but I don't want to, you know, live a, a boring life till I get there. And so I'm going to hang on to this sin because, you know, sin is fun for a season, right? No, sin is sin. We need to repent. Well, that's verse 7 of Luke chapter 3, and that's just my first point. And it's tough stuff. I know it is tough stuff. And it's tough because... None of us ever want to admit that we need to repent. None of us want to be told that we need to repent. But I honestly believe that just like lost people that I talked to and that I talked about at the beginning, we know that deep down inside there are things in our lives that we need to repent of. And so as I leave you with that, I want to assure you that once we've repented, once we've come with that 
heart of repentance that says, God, forgive me of whatever it is in my life that is not pleasing with you. And he'll show you what that is. Once we do that, we have freedom. And that's where the power is, the power of the Holy Spirit to move and work and have his being in our life. Father, we thank you now for your word, and we pray that you would take your word, that it would be pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing with the truth that will give us that freedom. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lord bless.